All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We're a couple minutes after the hour here. So I'd like to welcome you to our, our seminar series this week. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Love here uh, to give the presentation today. Uh, and so Jeffrey is a research geophysicist in the geomagnetism program of the U.S. Geological Survey, the USGS. Uh, over his career, he has studied several aspects of geomagnetism. Uh, these days, he works in collaboration with colleagues on three subjects uh, using geomagnetic monitoring, da uh, monitoring data and magneto uh, magnetoelectric uh, survey data to evaluate geoelectric hazards of concern uh, to the electric power grid industry. And statistical analysis of the rare occurrences of these intense magnetic storms uh, is also included in his, in his work and analysis of historical records of past space weather events uh, and their impacts is included as well. Uh, one of which we're gonna hear about today, the, mag the May 1921 magnetic superstorm. Uh, so with that, Dr. Love, take it away. All right, Jason, thank you for that. And all of those different <clears throat> kind of aspects of my research actually come together in this particular presentation. So I'm kind of happy about that. So the May 1921 magnetic superstorm, I want to talk about some down to earth lessons. And I just want to first acknowledge my co-authors um, on the paper, <clears throat> Ed Cliver and Hisashi Hayakawa, um, they had or they do very different kinds of research, but and they had different roles in this project, but very important roles. And I appreciated this work wouldn't have happened without them. <clears throat> so in this cartoon representation of the Earth in the Earth's magnetic field, just kind of briefly remind you of things that you already know, just to bring them to the forefront of your uh, attention. Um, the Earth's magnetic field, the main part of it is generated in the Earth's core. Um, it extends from the core up to the surface of the earth where we can measure it, and then it extends out into space. And the extent of that magnetic field in space is of course the magnetosphere. Um, during a magnetic storm, the magnetic field in space is time dependent, it's active, and it in turn induces electric currents and electric fields in the electrically conducting solid earth. And we can measure those too. So there is this kind of um, circle of of causes and effects that we can measure with magnetometers at the Earth's surface. <clears throat> so with that little brief introduction of, of geoelectromagnetism, I'll um, move on to the first slide here. Um, the May 13 to 15, 1921 magnetic storm is interesting and important for a number of reasons. It's one of the most important, one of the most intense magnetic storms ever recorded. It caused the widespread disruption of radio, telegraph, and telephone systems. And it might seem a little bit small in terms of <clears throat> modern events, but it was responsible for at least three fires in New York City and, and New York State um, associated with the railway stations. Um, that's a small, you know, it, it, like I say, in, in modern terms, that seems kind of small, but we can draw some lessons from that and understand why that happened, um, where it happened and when it happened. Um, during this, this storm, auroras were seen at very low latitude, uh, including Samoa and Puerto Rico. And from this storm, like I say, we can draw lessons regarding the impacts to modern technology. Um, I just want to call attention not only to our paper, which is um, uh, referenced at the bottom, but to another paper by Mike Hapgood that came out just a couple months before our paper. <clears throat> um, it's also a very fine paper, um, and it is a fine paper. And <clears throat> um, it's very different from ours, and I just invite you to look at that. It's um, mostly concentrated on the effects of the storm. Um, we had kind of a little bit more diversity of, of um, interests, um, and we looked at the intensity of the magnetic storm and its effects, but mostly confined to uh, uh, the United States. So, <clears throat> all right, so um, just kind of for a bit of color. Um, it's kind of fun to look at old newspaper reports, especially from small towns in the United States. So the Oak, Oak Mulgee uh, Daily Democrat um, in Oklahoma, a small town in Oklahoma in the United States, reported the storm as cutting off um, Oklahoma from wire communications with both the outside world, with the outside world, by the queer effects of Aurora Borealis. Um, and uh, so that's just you know an amusing kind of uh, headline that was realized during this after this storm. Um, the Pomona, California Bulletin: Electrical waves envelop the Earth, and 
telegraph ser service goes lame. <clears throat> and then finally, magnetic storm cripples wires, uh, northern lights, the cinema of the sky in brilliant showing. <clears throat> So concentrate now on, on what happened during the storm in New York. Um, so from the New York Times, we understand that sunspots were credited with a rail tie up New York central signal system put on out of service by the play of the Northern Lights. And I'll just quote this. The interruption of the signal switching system was reported to have been due to ground current, one of the disturbances accompanying the electrical storm between uh, 57th Street and Grand Central Station, the automatic signaling and switching devices and the telephone and telegraph systems of the road were immediately stopped the railroad. Fumes came from the installation of electrical wires in the tower and dense smoke followed. You know, I, I, I think these, these quotes are interesting because they display quite a bit of understanding of, of what was going on. They understand that currents were being induced in the earth and that these were finding their ways into electrical systems. So even in 1921, and even in the popular press, there was some pretty good understanding of what was going on. <clears throat> the Bridgeport Telegram, um, Aurora Borealis fires the railway depot telegraph operator at Brewster Station, driven from the apparatus by the flare, the flare of the fire on his apparatus. So just a quote, investigation has convinced officials of the Central New England Railroad that a fire which destroyed the railroad station at Brewster, New York, late on Saturday night was caused by the Aurora Borealis. The work of telegraph operator Hatch, that's his name, who was on duty at the time of the fire had been interrupted during the evening by electricity arising from the phenomenon in the sky. He was driven from his telegraph key by the electric fluid, which flared out in broad flame, which despite the efforts of the operator enveloped the switchboard in flames. <clears throat> and finally, the, um, a report from the telephone review. And this one's a um, uh, li little bit more obscure. It's not always reported in the scientific literature. Aurora takes the wires in Albany, New York. Aurora is blamed for setting a fire the Union Railway Station, not only burning the building, <clears throat> but also damaging a great many of our company cables, that is telephone cables, which happen to be installed in the same room with the New York Central, uh, with, uh, with the New York Central's telephone equipment. So just put this onto a map. This is a map showing the uh, railway system in New York State um, in about 1921. Um, and see, you can see my cursor here. Um, New York City is down here in the bottom. And there's a uh, set of major railway station, uh, railway lines that run north and then westward. And I just highlighted here with these uh, orange dots, the locations of those three fires. And they all appear to be possibly even on the same line, um, which is quite, quite interesting. So um, let's just keep that in mind <clears throat> and recognize um, something which is important here. Um, in the 1920s and in decades thereabout, the railways were being managed and their locations of the trains and their schedule was being managed using telegraph systems, which were installed kind of collinearly with the railway lines themselves. They, the, um, they needed to know where the trains were and when they were. Um, and so railway companies had extensive telegraph systems and those amounted to long uh, conducting uh, systems which are grounded to the earth and and there, thereby um, are susceptible to the effects of the magnetic storm. We'll talk about that in a bit of detail. Okay, so just a simple question, why might the impacts of this storm have been concentrated in the Northeast United States? I think that's an important question to ask. <clears throat> and I just wanna put it into perspective. It's not the only storm that has had effects concentrated in the Northeast United States. I'm also working on a different project um, for the March 1989 storm, which is also a very intense storm, not as intense as the 21 storm, but, but a very um, impactful storm. And I've been uh, putting together a, um, a list, uh, a data set of the anomalies that were realized on power grids over the uh, United States and Canada. And this is a map showing the locations of all of those operational no anomalies that were realized during the 1989 storm. And you can see, 
1989, those anomalies were concentrated in the Northeast United States. And I think that's, that's an important uh, similarity to note. All right, so just briefly talk about um, the physics that's going on in terms of induction of currents in the solid earth. Um, you can think of this in terms of, ab in abstract terms, like displayed at the very top of this slide. We have an input signal as a time series. It's convolved with a filter and there's an output that is of interest. In the case here that we're talking about, geomagnetic activity driven by solar terrestrial interaction interacts with the solid earth. The solid earth is complicated in structure. Um, you know, we have the whole subject of geology that's interested in that, but the heterogeneous structure of the solid earth means in a, for us that the earth has a heterogeneous electrical conductivity structure and that conductivity differs quite considerably from one location to another as a function of geography and depth um, due to heterogeneous geological structures. <clears throat> the geomagnetic field um, interacts with that geology and conductivity and gives us a geoelectric field. And that geoelectric field is the output signal that's interesting and that is a concern for the power grid industry as shown there on the right. All right, so that's qualitative. And we can be more quantitative in this whole kind of discussion. We um, use magnetic observatory data um, collected at observatories in the United States and Canada. Um, for example, that's uh, our focus area. Um, this uh, uh, picture on the lower left is a picture of the Fredericksburg Observatory in the Eastern United States in Virginia. <clears throat> um, so we use magnetic field records and we use measurements of the Earth's surface impedance. Now this, these are a set of tensors, essentially a set of numbers that describe the induction relationship between magnetic activity and the induced electric field. And those, that, those numbers are properties of the solid earth, it's the impedance um, tensors, and they don't change uh, for our purposes over time because the solid earth is changing very slowly over time. Um, and so we can make measurements of that re relationship between B and E, um, natural magnetic field variation inducing electric fields at the earth's surface by measuring the magnetic field and the electric field at the same time, essentially st setting up a magnetometer and putting a voltmeter into, this, into the earth. Once you make those measurements for a little while, um, the data become essentially redundant. So after about three weeks or so, you pick the systems up and you install them in a new location. So those are electromagnetic survey measurements, which are different from the magnetic monitoring data, um, which are coming from the magnetic observatories. If you combine these two data sets, um, look at the statistics of the electric field that comes out of that analysis, you can put together something that we call the geoelectric hazard map, which is shown here on the right. And you can project, project those electric fields onto the power grid of the United States as we've done. And that gives us the voltage um, that we can expect on the power grid lines. And you do the statistics and you can see what the voltages would be for say a hundred year magnetic storm. And that's what we have there on the right. I'll come back to that. So it's a, a lot of work here. There's monitoring data, there's survey data, there's analysis. Um, it involve, involves a, a, a collaboration between the USGS, the University of Colorado, NOAA, and NASA. All right, to just um, essentially advertise the importance of heterogeneous conductivity structure, um, this is a little schematic um, discussing magnetic field variations which are generated by a time-dependent current in space. So that current is J naught as shown here, just schematically showing is flowing overhead. <coughs> Um, if that current is, say, increasing intensity in intensity, then the magnetic field that it generates is of increasing intensity. It's time dependent and it will induce an electric field in the solid earth. And the efficiency with which that induction happens and the efficiency with which the currents uh, flow in the solid earth depends upon the conductivity structure of the solid earth. So the currents flow very easily, tending to neutralize the electric field in high con conducting highly conducting rock and the more resistive rock, the electric field is more persistent. The electric current has a hard time flowing. And if you happen to have a power grid deployed across 
an electrically resistive rock structure. The current can't flow so easily through that rock structure, takes the path of least resistance, and sometimes ends up flowing through the power grid itself. That, that is the crux of the problem for the power grid industry. Those are uncontrolled currents, um, quasi-direct. They um, uh, have a, a wide spectrum of variation, um, but they are not the nice tidy controlled alternating current, which the power grid is designed for. That causes problems with the, the uh, transformers and that in turn uh, distorts the uh, waveform, the alternating current waveform, which can cause uh, relays to trip and um, lead to inefficiencies in the power grid and even damage transformers themselves. <clears throat> All right, so that's, that's that. And getting back to this hazard map that I was discussing a couple slides ago, um, we've been using the survey data and the uh, magnetic observatory monitoring data, combining it together to find out what the uh, voltages could be expected on the modern power grid system of the United States. And this is the result of that analysis. It's a project that was spearheaded by one of our postdocs, Greg Lucas, who now works at the University of Colorado. And I would like to say that I am really happy with our projects uh, being able to produce this product. This is a really important product and it really is useful for the power grid industry. It shows that the geoelectric hazards are high in the Eastern United States and in the upper Midwestern part of the United States right here. Um, and it also shows that the electric hazards are low in other places. So that combination tells us where we have to concentrate our effort in order to make the electric power grid more resilient. <clears throat> and it also shows us how high and how low they are. This is a quantitative map, it's not just a qualitative description. And I just call attention to the fact that the, essentially the topography of this hazard is quite um, dramatic. The electric, geoelectric hazards are very high in the Eastern United States and they can be 100th as high in other parts of the United States, even as, as small as 1,000th as high. So that means that the currents that would be typically driven in the power grid are up to, are typically a thousand times higher in some places or hundred or a thousand times higher in some places than they are in other places. So the hazard is really quite heterogeneous. This uh, project was um, reported on by IEEE Spectrum, Energy Wire, Physics World, National Geographics, Scientific American, Bloomberg News, and spaceweather.com. Okay, so that gives us some, I'm just gonna go back here. Um, whoops, see if I can. Um, so just call attention that um, this, the Eastern United States here is an area of high hazard. And if you had telegraph lines like were deployed in 1921 for the or the railway, um, depending on you know, the length of those lines, where they're grounded, the localized geomagnetic activity, all of those factors, you can get very localized uh, um, impacts on the telegraph system. And that's what we think was happening in 1921. <clears throat> okay, so how intense was the 1921 storm? Um, a standard measure of the 1920, of storms, of course, is the DST index, it's an index which is uh, constructed from low latitude ground level geomagnetic disturbance data collected at different observatories. Typically, um, the observatories as shown here um, uh, are for the modern version of the DST index, um, Honolulu, San Juan, both of which are USGS observatories, Hermanus in South Africa and Kakioka, Japan contribute data to the modern Kakioka version of, of this index. Um, there's another, I would say, very good version of this index uh, produced by Oulu University in Finland um, and doing it, I think, in a slightly better way. Um, so I just want to uh, call that out. Um, that's fine. Uh, those observatories, though, either were not operating in 1921 or there were some problems uh, with their operation. Um, there was no observatory, for example, in South Africa and I don't believe there was one in Japan either. Um, and uh, there was, was uh, observatory operations in Honolulu and San Juan, but the uh, uh, storm was so active, it went off scale. So the historical records for the 1921 storm are difficult to find, um, but we have found them. We have four observatories that contribute to 
essentially an equivalent version of DST um, in Samoa and Brazil and Spain and in Australia. And we're going to uh, use those to calculate DST for this particular storm. Um, uh, so the index itself is formed from these magnetic observatory records, <clears throat> but the index is commonly interpreted in terms of the intensity of the ring current. And so it's got this schematic of the anatomy of the magnetosphere there on the left. Um, when the magneto magnetic uh, storm builds up in intensity, the ring current intensifies and by Ampere's law, that generates a magnetic field at the surface of the earth, which is southward directed or contrary to the prevailing direction of the earth's magnetic field. So with the intensification of the ring current, the intensity at low latitudes of the Earth's magnetic field actually decreases. So that gives you that characteristic decrease in DST, which you see in um, DST records. All right, so I want to emphasize that these data are not digital, they're analog. They were collected by analog systems. Uh, um, it's a, a, a system for automatically monitoring Earth's magnetic field and its variation over time, which was developed in the middle of the 19th century. And was in continuous use really all the way up until the 1980s. Um, it was it's one of the most long, longest operating uh, kinds of technology that uh, we've had for space weather. Um, it's really quite ingenious. What you do is you, you set up something that's based on essentially on the compass. Um, you take magnetized magnets um, and you suspend them by tiny little fibers and allow the magnet to orient itself um, in response to the changing Earth's magnetic field. On those magnets, you attach a small mirror and then you shine a beam of light at that mirror and that beam of light is deflected and projected onto a piece of photographic paper that's mounted onto a cylinder that rotates once per day. So as the magnetic field varies, the deflection of the beam of light varies, and that is recorded on this piece of photographic paper. And typically at the observatories, then they would take this piece of photographic paper off on a regular schedule, um, and they would develop it you know, in a dark room. And they would take out a ruler and measure the variation over time and uh, apply some conversion factors and report the data in nanoteslas. As a, as a function of time. So it's a um, very um, kind of low resolution um, way of measuring the Earth's magnetic field, but actually quite accurate. Um, and um, I think it's uh, uh, just fascinating, actually. Um, and the, when you think back about the um, history of magnetic observatories and the operation in this way, and the amount of data that are available, typically they're reported as hourly data, um, and the amount of labor that was involved is quite amazing. Um, anyway, this is a, uh, a resource which we are going to exploit in order to better understand the 1921 storm. <clears throat> and like I was uh, saying, at many observatories, this storm was so intense that the deflection of the beam of light went off this edge of the paper. And so that means that at many observatories, we don't have complete records of this storm. Um, so we had to search around and find uh, observatory records that were complete or as complete as possible. Um, in fact, one of ours has a, a, a short data gap. Um, but we, we have three complete, completely complete uh, records of the 1921 storm and another one which provides us a good amount of data for the storm. So there we are. Now, just want to say one, there's a little bit of kind of, uh, I would say sleuthing that we had to do to figure out the, uh, how to use the magnetogram from Brazil. Um, this is actually a, a photograph of that analog record from Vesuris, Brazil, um, as reported in the yearbook. And my colleague, Hisashi Hayakawa, came to me with this magnetogram and was trying to make sense out of it. <laughs> And I looked at it and then at first I was, I thought this is just garbage actually. Um, sometimes, sometimes things just aren't recorded right and this does not look right. Um, so if we're looking at time going from left to right, um, it's hard to identify the commencement of the storm. Um, it just doesn't look normal. And also when we look at the different axes that are being recorded here, 
um, D, which is the uh, horizontal deflection or the declination of the Earth's magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field, shows a lot of variation over time, whereas the horizontal intensity um, shows very little in, um, variation over time. So that is the opposite of what we would expect. And so I, you know, was kind of pessimistic about this, but then I was looking at this and uh, looking at it again, and then I realized, hey, this magnetogram is actually upside down. Um, and, and so I turned it upside down, and here on the bottom, we have the magnetogram for May 13 and 14, 1921, and up on the top now, it is for May 14 and 15. And now, as can, we would conventionally expect, time is going from left to right. But then furthermore, the H and the D scales are mislabeled. Um, what is labeled here as D is actually H, and what's H is actually D. Um, and when you look at it that way, look at this scale here, and see, oh yeah, there is a sudden commencement, um, the arrival of the shock wave, the coronal mass ejection. There's another sudden commencement. Here's the main phase of the storm in terms of horizontal intensity being recorded there in this mislabeled upside down um, magnetogram. What's going on here at the top is also quite interesting. Um, you see that the um, H trace, which is this active trace right here, actually wraps around. Um, you can see the variation uh, in intensity decreases here and it has an active period, but that same active period is seen up here. Um, what's happening, and, and the reason this magnetogram is interesting, is because the observatory had a small mirror in place which deflected the beam of light for a second time if it was going to go off the edge of the paper. And that, def that secondary mirror caused the magnetogram to wrap around, which is what we have here. So this is a complete magnetogram. When we look at it, turn it right side up, um, correct the mislabeling, we understand that we have a complete record of the Earth's magnetic field for the May 1921 storm. This was an important um, part of our analysis. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I sometimes get asked, well, why did this happen? What, what's going on at the observatory where they could get something upside down, mislabel it? I don't know um, is the short answer, but I can speculate that because the storm was just so you know, big, ginormous, um, that the worker didn't recognize the variation itself. And that led to some mistakes in labeling and in presentation of this magnetogram, but we've got it all straightened out. And when we did uh, straighten it out, put it right side up, put those uh, um, fragments that are represented kind of in wrapping around in the magnetogram, put it all together, we can get the continuous time series and um, develop hourly samples from that record. And so that's what we show here on the top right here. This is the um, fixed up version of the Vesuvius magnetogram for the May 1921 storm. It's one of the stations now contributing a continuous record for this particular storm. Um, and I applied some calibration factors, which converted my measurements in terms of millimeters into nan nanoteslas and we show that there on the left. So this is a calibrated magnetogram. We take hourly samples from that, take hourly samples from the Wadaru Observatory record, which was fine, and the Apia record in Samoa, which was fine, and the um, San Fernando station, which is fine, except for a, a short data gap Unfortunately, right in the um, most intense part of the storm, but that's okay. We have three um, complete magnetograms over the whole duration of the storm and combine those in, and uh, together, which is what we're showing there on the bottom and average them together with a, a latitude factor. <clears throat> and that gives us DST. So the individual magnetograms are shown there. It turns out Wadaru is in gray, um, the Vesuvius magnetogram is in green, and the, the DST time series is this black time series. It's the average of all those magnetograms. The Vesuvius magnetogram is actually really quite um, close to the average, the longitudinal average from all the observatories. <clears throat> and you can see the, of course, the classic development of the main phase, the intensity decreasing at low latitudes, and it reaches a, a minimum value 
at about 900, negative 900 nanoteslas, I think it's 907. <clears throat> and that is quite considerable. That is um, uh, very much comparable, perhaps even larger than the corresponding estimate you might make from the Carrington event. Um, the Carrington event is recorded less completely than the 1921 storm. It's important to realize that. It, there's only one complete record for the Carrington event and that comes from an observatory in India. Um, in those days in 1859, um, lots of magnetograms were not completely recording the intensity of the Carrington event, but in India, they were still making the measurements visually. And so they had a complete record um, but it's only from one station that we're estimating DST. And if you look at the hourly values of the variation recorded there, you'd estimate that the intensity of the Carrington event is about minus 850 nanoteslas. So the 1921 storm is comparable to the Carrington event, um, even though we understand that the Carrington event is not recorded with um, such reliability as the 21 storm. Um, but we have two really big storms now that we can analyze and understand in terms of statistics of storm occurrences, in terms of the variation of magnetic activity during really intense storms, Carrington event and the 1921 storm. And I think that's, um, I think that's kind of nice. So, so putting all this in perspective, <clears throat> um, as I was just discussing the 1859 Carrington event, um, just, summarize that in the upper left-hand corner, one of the most intense storms ever recorded, um, complete record only obtained from India. Roars were seen at low latitude, including down to the Caribbean, like the 1921 storm, widespread disruption of telegraph services. And 1921 storm on the upper right-hand corner, again, one of the most intense storms ever recorded, disruption of radio, telegraph, and telephone systems, and three fires in New York state and city, which, um, we can understand because of the essentially the high impedance and the relatively high uh, latitude for the Northeast United States. You can imagine for a storm as intense as uh, 907 nanoteslas that the auroral oval would have really come down to, to uh, you know, American latitudes and, and really driven electric fields through the heterogeneous earth and ended up with um, lots of electric fields in the Northeast United States. Put that in context with the 1989 storm, which I've already mentioned briefly, complete collapse of the Hydro-Quebec system, three to $4 billion economic damage for Canada, electric blackouts in Sweden, widespread disruption of telephone, telegraph and radios, damage to satellites, disruption of geophysical surveys, Aurora seen again um, at low latitudes, including down to the Caribbean. Um, it, all of this causes people to think that, well, if we had a future superstorm, um, significant damage could be inflicted onto civilian and military satellites, widespread disruption of GPS, radio communication, geophysical surveys, perhaps widespread and, and um, persistent loss of electricity, which really would be economically damaging. And it depends on who you ask as to what the impact would be in terms of dollar amounts but there is a National Academy of Sciences study that, that suggests that, you know, if we had long, um, widespread and long duration uh, loss of electricity, that would be quite costly to the US economy to the tune of one to $2 trillion and globally um, two and a half to three and a half trillion dollars. So this, this kind of, uh, these kinds of assessments motivate future, motivate um, uh, US government projects to coordinate uh, work on this subject. And I, I am working for the US government, so I am essentially doing what I'm told to work on these kinds of projects, enjoying it all the way, but it is something that is uh, something that's mandated for us to do. All right, so we can put this into perspective um, statistically to understand uh, you know, how often storms like this might occur because um, now we have this nice quantitative measurement of the 1921 storm, and um, we can do similar analyses of, of historical records for um, solar cycles that occurred before the kind of classic beginning of the DST time series. The DST time series from Kyoto, at least, is, is continuous from 1957 to present. Um, so 
let's see, that would be solar cycle 19 through uh, 24 or 25. Um, and I've been working lately to reconstruct some of the intensities, DST intensities for other storms and extend um, our estimates for those storms. And right now we have estimates going back to solar cycle 14 for what we think are the most intense and the second most intense storms of each solar cycle. So I have worked on a, a statistical analysis to understand how to analyze these essentially ranked data, um, looking just at the most intense and second most intense storm of each solar cycle and use that to understand <clears throat> the occurrence probability of these kinds of storms. And that's something I show here in this particular chart. Um, basically, this is the cumulative uh, probability of storm occurrences per solar cycle. And when you look at this, um, and I won't you know, walk you through all the details of this, but I'll summarize it there on the bottom, using data from the last 11 solar cycles and a variety of extreme value models, um, we can say that a storm, the, the probability of a storm with a DST, minus D DST intensity of 900 nanoteslas like the 1921 storm is just 0.02 per solar cycle. That's a small number. In other words, such a storm looks like possibly a 500 year event. Um, yet we've had two since 1859. And you know, that might or might not be uh, paradoxical. Um, it looks like we've had just two rare events in the last 150 or so years. <clears throat> um, a Carrington event in the 1921 storm. And you might say, well, how is that possible? Why? Uh, you know, just doesn't seem to be consistent. In fact, it is um, still possibly consistent. Uh, statistics works that way. Um, sometimes you have rare events. And when you do have a rare event, um, you, it causes you to focus your attention on it and to wonder then about the statistical likelihood of its occurrence. Um, so we kind of bias ourselves in, you know, looking at the rare events and ignoring other th rare things that aren't happening um, in recent time and not focusing on those. So it's a combination of those two things, statistics and the bias that we bring to look at rare events, which I think is at play here. <clears throat> All right, so just wrap up here. The May 1921 magnetic storm reminded the world that space weather above our heads affected electrical systems on the Earth's surface. And again, I think it's really just um, interesting and, and um, encouraging, if you like, um, that the popular press in 1921 really understood this. Um, they understood that ground-induced electric fields and currents can affect grounded technology systems like the telegraph system. Today, we know that storm-induced geoelectric fields, which threaten ground-based electrical systems, such as like telegraph systems in 1921, are strongly affected by the electrical conductivity structure beneath the Earth, the Earth's surface, that is the geology. And from this, we have some understanding as to why the impacts of this storm were realized in the Northeast United States. The intensity of the 1921 storm with a maximum minus DST of 907 nanoteslas is comparable to the Carrington event. And statistical analysis of storms from the last 11 solar cycles show that this is possibly something like a 500 year event. This may or may not be paradoxical. And uh, again, I'll just call attention to our publication, which now came out a couple of years ago. Um, very happy about that. and. Uh, and there we are. And thank you for allowing me to present these results. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Love. A really interesting talk and fascinating subject for me personally. Ever since I entered the field, I remember hearing of these superstorms. So it was just a very nice and clear uh, presentation as well. Uh, we have some questions coming in. And before we jump to those, I do want to just I mentioned for next week, we're expecting to have Matthew Owens to also talk about extreme space weather events in the solar cycle. And also just a foreshadowing up to, uh, to next year in January, we're expecting to have Dr. Love back with us again, potentially talk about the 1989 storm, which right. you mentioned briefly in this talk. So we're already looking forward to that one. Uh, all right, so with that, let's jump into some of the questions that are starting to roll in. Uh, so Eric Lund was asking, how sensitive is the probability estimate of the 0 0.02 or the 2% solar cycle uh, to errors in estimating the tail of the distribution? In other words, how robust is the 500 year event estimate? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, and I would say 
for the for the 21 and 1859 storm, um, um, it's, it looks like it's robust. I, mean, I can only analyze the data that we have. Um, if you were to take out some of the data, if you were to take out the 1921 storm, for example, and do the statistical analysis, it, it looks like the 1921 storm is not really drastically affecting that extrapolation. Um, so in that sense, it's robust. Um, you know, if we had a bunch of other additional data that came in, it could affect it. But um, the data that we have, looking at it and looking at subsets, indicates that it looks like it's a fairly robust storm. It's not a once in a hundred year storm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, and next question from Hugh Hudson. Uh, could you comment on the choice of fitting the function or the fitting function for the event distribution? Um, why a Weibull distribution in that case? Yeah, so we, we looked at several different functions. Um, let me back up here. Let's see. Oh. I'm gonna try to do it this way. And oh, there we go. Um, well, we looked at several different functions, uh, a Gumbel distribution, a generalized extreme value distribution, and a Weibull distribution. And they don't make a whole lot of difference in terms of what kind of extrapolation you have. You see, it's right down here. Um, there's some difference, um, maybe, about, maybe about a factor of two. Um, could be a thousand year event, <laughs> um, or it could be a 500 year event. Um, so, you know, in this kind of business, talking about that extreme of an event, whether it's a thousand year or a 500 year event is not a big difference. And so, um, factor of two, um, it's still not a hundred year event. And, and so it's really not super sensitive to the particular function you use. There's a, kind of a philosophy that you might attach to each one of those distributions. And that's discussed actually in this statistics paper, which I published earlier, earlier this year, um, the, you know, what, what these different distributions mean in this context. And it, again, it's not making a super big difference. I, I, I know that that might sound like I'm kind of waving my hands a lot, but um, you, we, I'm trying hard and other people try hard to do very careful statistical analysis, but in the end, you know that the results for such distant extrapolations into the tails come with uncertainties. So it's still not a hundred year event. Yeah, certainly. All right, thanks for that. And let's see, next question. Uh, Jason Durr was wondering, are there any geologically based mitigation efforts which might attempt to modify the differences in ground conductivity or increase the conductivity, uh, or for instance, laying down additional grids to, di to divert the large induced currents, things like that? Right, so um, there's no attempt to change the conductivity of the earth. Um, that would not be possible. Um, we can look though at where the conductivity of the earth affects the hazards like I'm showing in this hazard map and <clears throat> understand where the hazards are high, where they're low, where we need to concentrate our mitigation efforts on the power grid system. And there's a lot of details in here, um, which I haven't really touched on, but the solid earth does a lot to the induced electric field that needs to be accommodated if you wanna say predict currents on a power grid system. And we're not there yet. We're not predicting currents. We're just measuring the geophysical signal at the moment. And the reason we're not predicting the currents is because the data for the current, the power grid system are just not up to, sh up to snuff. Um, they don't have the grounding resistances at the substations. You can't do Kirchhoff's law without those numbers. Um, so to do the full blown, fully formal, analysis of GICs on power grid system for the United States. We can't do it at the moment, but we can look at the hazard, the natural hazard, which is what we're focused on. And I'm a natural scientist, so that's okay. Um, and, and so again, it just highlights where the power grid industry needs to concentrate their effort. Um, and, and that affects also the planning for the installation of new power grid systems. You know, you hear a lot about the smart power grid and I'm all in favor of smart power grids, but I'm also in favor of being smart about how we deploy a smart power grid. And this kind of map shows us, gives us some uh, direction on how to do that. Certainly, makes sense, thank you. 
And let's see, next question from Widem Reeve. Uh, did you find any evidence uh, or reports of electrical power system failures during this 1921 storm? Or were all the reports mainly about telegraph slash Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, for different historical storms, and I'm working on a bunch of them, 1940, for example, um, you see uh, different kinds of technological systems um, displaying their vulnerabilities and others, you don't hear about it. Um, and, and so, I don't know of records that are specifically about the power grid system in the United States having, you know, real operational problems. They, they, uh, there might be some random records showing, hey, we got this or that current, but whether or not that actually had impact on the operation of the system, I don't know of such a report for the United States. Um, they were primarily about telegraph systems. <clears throat> of course, the power grid system that was in place in 1920 one was a whole lot less extensive than it is today. And, um, and of course the telegraph system is not extensive today. Um, so we're more concentrated on the power grid system for today, not really caring so much about telegraph systems. Um, there's other storms that have other kinds of dichotomies and impacts. 1940, um, for example, March, 1940, uh, it's a very interesting storm. It had a lot of a lot of effects on telephone systems. It had some effects on on uh, power grid systems, but really the extensive system impacted in 1940 was the telephone system. So these technologies change over time. The deployment across the geography of the Earth changes over time, and and I think that's uh, resulting in a change in the the kind of impact that's realized on these technology systems for different storms. Certainly, yeah, very interesting. And in a way, it sort of segues to the next question here, kind of more speculative, but also just asking about kind of the man-induced man effects on this system. So specifically, George is wondering, with the proliferation of nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. an EMP event over the US could become more probable. Uh, have you done any work on these types of man-induced effects uh, on the system, whether you know, military or civilian, I suppose? Okay, I just want to tell people this was not a planted question, but the answer is yes, we have. Um, um, my uh, this group I work with at the USGS, we also have been applying the lessons we've learned from magnetic storms to understand electromagnetic pulse effects on the United States power grid system. Again, since I work for the government, I'm working on things which the government's interested in, and that's certainly one of them. Um, we have a paper on that subject, and I don't have the citation here in my presentation, but if you're interested in it, um, you can go to go to my website, jeffreylove.org. Um, it's in the publication section there. Um, and as you might, might expect, the geology, or you might expect now that I've walked you through some of these issues, but the EMP community, I don't think was fully coming to terms with the fact that geology, the electrical conductivity structure of solid earth is an important factor for understanding the EMP hazard. Um, and we don't know what the EMP hazard is in detail across the United States, but I think we should be looking where the hazards are high for magnetic storms. That is in the Eastern United States and in the upper Midwest, just because we have high hazards there for storms, we might expect it for EMP. There's gonna be some differences, of course. EMP has a higher frequency content than magnetic storms do. Um, but the signal that they're interested in for EMP is something known as E3, um, which covers a frequency band from about uh, 10 hertz out to about 100 seconds. Um, that's just a little bit higher than magnetic storm frequency band, which is for something from about 1 hertz out to 10,000 seconds. That's interesting. So there's a lot of overlap, but there's some differences. And for that reason, I think we need to do some additional surveying um, in the Northeast and Upper Midwest United States to better understand what the EMP hazard is in those places. All right, certainly very interesting to think of prepared, prepared talk, efforts. We could talk on that if people are interested. So yeah, certainly we can keep that, keep that in mind. It was a very engaging talk. So there's several questions here and we have some extra minutes here. Uh, last one here, I have to throw in a question of my own in a second, but uh, let's see. So Antonio, I uh, was wondering, do you have a hypothesis uh, as to why the WAT observatory shows about 500 nanotesla more intense uh, DSD yeah. than the others? That's really very interesting. That's yet another thing I'm working on. 
<clears throat> um, if you just look at the kind of instantaneous variation of the magnetograms that go into DST, um, uh, there's you know differences depending on which observatory you look at. I, mean, I should pull that plot up here. Um, and the Wateru Observatory, um, there it is, um, happened to display a lot of uh, disturbance um, measured in a DST sort of way during the storm. Um, and it went down to something more than minus 1200 nanoteslas. Um, that's a localized effect. And you could just, you can speculate about why that might be. Um, asymmetry in the ring current, um, or really more, more likely field aligned currents um, affecting the localized signal and the geomagnetic disturbance during the storm. And that gets averaged over when you use these four stations from different longitudes. But if you look at each individual station, you see that variance and that, that's interesting. And it tells you that the storm actually during this most intense part, during the deepest part of DST was really asymmetrical in terms of its magnetic signature on the Earth's surface. And I don't find that surprising at all. Um, you know, really intense storm, the, the magnetosphere is really being distorted by the solar wind. And, and so there's asymmetric currents flowing in and uh, asymmetric field line currents flowing in and out of the Earth's ionosphere. Um, and those affect the estimate of DST. Um, and, but it, it raises an interesting question. You know, if you're trying to estimate the Carrington event and you have only a magnetogram from one station um, and you look at the most intense part of that magnetogram when the disturbance was at its greatest depth, you uh, could be obtaining a biased estimate for the estimate of DST. Um, and that's a project I'm working on. Um, I don't have anything to show you at the moment, um, but stay tuned. And, and it, it, you get a biased estimate if you're using hourly data, you get an even more biased estimate if you're using essentially instantaneous values of the magnetogram. So um, there's an interesting statistical analysis you can do there. And that's something I'm wading through at the moment, so. Great, well, thank you very much. And by the way, in the chat, uh, Scott had posted a link to one of, to that paper that you mentioned it from Earth and Space Science about the EMP. Uh, oh, thank so, you. Yeah, thank feel free people can great. check out that thank link. You, people. Thanks yeah, so, so yep. Yeah. And let's see, I think there's another, another comment coming in here. I'll just quickly squeak in my question at this point. So. You can hear me okay, the, right? So yeah, certainly. Okay. So sure. and I think, yeah, we, yeah, we can hear you. And uh, so I was just curious about that uh, flipped upside down plot, <laughs> of course, yeah, it's very remarkable, yeah. by the way. I was That's just kind of a fun we, story. Yeah, absolutely. And I was, the question came to my mind as well was one of scale. Did we, did you say there was sort of a calibration in terms of nano Tesla from this yes. scale? I don't know if it was indicated, but. Yeah, you have, to, you have to, so this, these are magnetograms and uh, paper magnetograms and you measure their vertical uh, variation with a ruler, just like you know, they did in the old days. And then you apply a, a, a calibration factor, which fortunately was reported in the yearbook. Um, so with that calibration factor, I was able to work out the nanoteslas per millimeter um, that you get need to uh, calibrate these magnetograms. Okay, interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it looks like there's another comment here in the talk. They were just mentioning about the you know different uh, different locations, the uneven locations for these DST stations. I think that's a oh, follow-up yeah. to an earlier question. Um, so yeah, that affects these various statistics. And let's see. Uh, next, there's a question from Ricky. Uh, what types of solar observations are available from the time period that might show activity that caused this storm? Yeah, um, uh, that's a great question. Um, my colleague Hisashi Hayakawa has a paper, it's not specifically on a 1921 storm, and I'm sorry, I don't know the citation for it, but it's looking at several storms. Um, the, looking at the solar record sunspots, um, you know, 1921, it's not modern times. Um, I'm not a, I tell you, I'm really a, a geophysicist. I really study the earth, so I can't speak with a lot of confidence on what was available or how useful it was for the storm, but I can tell you that we uh, tried to look at different uh, parts of the storm. Um, let's, let's pull this figure up here um, to understand what sudden commencement might have corresponded to some event on the sun. And we really couldn't work it out because there's just so much activity. In fact, before this um, storm, 
the magnetic field was just, it was just, you know, active, so much so active. It's really hard to see all the sudden commencements and work out a correlation with some uh, flare or CME that you might try to um, infer from data from 1921. I say that because maybe there's still work opportunity for a solar physicist to work with a geophysicist to try to work that out. Um, so I'll just mm -hmm. leave it at that. Yeah, certainly could be an interesting uh, follow-up study for sure. So, well, excellent. And again, just want to thank our speaker again. There are several comments already saying this, but a very engaging talk as evidenced by uh, many of the active questions. And uh, just thanks again for a very interesting presentation and, and summary of this event and potentially, you know, thoughts for the future events that, that could be coming. So. Hey, my pleasure. And I thank everybody for tuning in and um, I'll give a talk again next year on the 1989 storm. Um, exactly. Which has its yep. own peculiarities. So certainly we'll be very much looking forward to it. So. All right, thanks again, Dr. Love, and thanks everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Yep, have a good one.